Hey, welcome to our series we're calling Light Show. In fact, we kicked it off last week with our uh, annual Jingle Jam. That's when we kind of launched the Christmas season uh, every year at Cedar Ridge. And the title of that was Light Show. And so we're continuing with that. And we all know this about lights, right? Christmas lights, that they're a big part of the Christmas season. They're a big part of how we celebrate Christmas. Uh, uh, Christmas lights are a, a major part of our decorations. In fact, just last weekend, uh, I took some of my kids and grandkids to Branson to go to Silver Dollar City where they do their big Christmas light uh, display and they've got Christmas productions, all that. They advertise that they have 6.5 million lights up. And I, it, it's likely the case. Everything has Christmas lights all over it. In fact, not only 6.5 million lights, I suspect that when I was there, there were about 6.5 million people there with us as well. It was absolutely crazy, but that's what the way a lot of people celebrate Christmas, right? By just looking at Christmas lights. Maybe you have a tradition of, of driving around a town and looking at, at Christmas lights. I, I got curious, just wondering what, what was the history of, of Christmas lights? When did all that happen? And you know, long before Christmas lights were around, uh, people celebrated because Jesus is the light of the world. They celebrated with a candle. They would put uh, candles up or uh, uh, often they would put candles on Christmas tree. In fact, we've got records some 500 years ago of Martin Luther doing that very thing. But it wasn't until uh, 1882 that a guy named Jonathan, or excuse me, Edward Johnson, uh, who was a friend and a partner of Thomas Edison, by the way, who uh, basically invented the light bulb, when he decided that maybe there's a better way, instead of having to worry about fires and burning down houses at Christmas time because of candles, what if we just strung together eight colored light bulbs? And that began kind of the birth of the Christmas lights. Now, to begin with, it was expensive for people and that prevented it. Uh, in fact, we're told that those eight colored lights would cost a week's wages, right? So a lot of people didn't do that. And back in those days, a lot of people skeptical of electricity, didn't trust it. And so it took a while for Christmas lights to come around. And so we're going to talk about over the next few weeks this idea of lights, light show, Christmas lights, and what, what is the light uh, uh, for when we celebrate Christmas. And today we're going to talk about a light that guides us. Matthew chapter 2 tells us the story of uh, the magi or the wise man, uh, wise men. And so there's a, obviously a part of a, uh, a Christmas light uh, theme there. Uh, they follow a star, right? There's a light in the sky for them. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King uh, Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You know, we don't know much about these wise men or these magi. We don't know their names. We really don't know how many of them there they are. In fact, what we think we know, we probably really don't. We, we, you know, we just kind of pick up because a Christmas pageant tells us something, or there's a lot of tradition, honestly, that uh, not necessarily uh, is true. Uh, and so we really don't know a whole lot. What we do know is that they came from uh, the east from Babylon or Persia, we're not exactly sure. And we do know this, that they weren't really kings. Sometimes we talk about the three kings that came. They weren't really kings, they were advisors to kings. They were highly educated uh, in religion and in astrology. They were able to interpret the stars and they were able to interpret dreams. So here's the, here's the question. I, like, how did, how did all this happen? How, how did they know that this star meant the king of the Jews was born? And how did they know by just looking at the stars that that, that was the case? We don't really know, but if you go back 600 years, back in the Old Testament, we read about a guy named Daniel who was in, in Babylon and then ultimately it became Persia. Uh, same Daniel that we know of is in the lion's den, right? Daniel in the lion's den, that story. And in that, we know that God gave him this supernatural ability to be able to interpret dreams. And because of that, he became a wise man or a magi. In fact, Daniel was known as chief 
of the Magi. And here's what I think happened. I think more than, more than 600 years before these wise men we read about in Matthew chapter 2 went to find the baby Jesus in Bethlehem or wherever in that area, Daniel told them that this day would come. So God set in motion this, uh, this very thing. Uh, centuries before uh, these, these magi, before they even, even left on their journey. In fact, if you study uh, the Bible, there's only one Old Testament prophecy, prophecy that predicts the timing of Jesus' birth. And it, of course, is found in Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, and it just simply tells about the timing of the coming one or the anointed one. And it was told by an angel. And, you know, if you guessed who that angel was, Gabriel, you would be right. It's the same angel that appeared to Mary telling her that she was about to give birth to a son, Gabriel. And so this angel tells Daniel that it would be 483 years after a decree would be issued to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, that the anointed one would come, but it would be 483 years after the temple, or at least the, the issue to rebuild the temple uh, would be uh, uh, given. And so there's some, deb some debate about when this decree was actually given, but we know it was sometime around the time of Ezra. We've read that story before, talked about it. That's when King Xerxes told Ezra to rebuild the temple. And so... I think these magi were able to do the math. They were able to kind of process what that was. They knew about Daniel's prophecy 600 years before. They knew that the window for the Messiah was some, somewhere around this point. These men were educated. They, they, they would have been familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. They'd been reading them. They'd read Numbers 24, 17, where it said a scepter will rise out of Israel. So they knew where this was going to take place. And they had Daniel's prophecy and so they began to search the sky. Isn't it amazing that God guides some people, these people, from, uh, to worship his, his newly born son, right? And they came providing some symbolic gifts and some very practical gifts for, uh, for the family of Jesus. And, and, and God guides them on likely a thousand-mile journey and he does it with a, a, a message that had been given 600 years in advance. And he does it with the instrument of an astronomical anomaly. Listen, what that says to me that if, if, it, if God can do that, God can guide anybody. It, if God will go to that extreme to help people find Jesus, he certainly can guide you to him. And He can help you and guide you in everyday matters of life. God has gone to great lengths to help us find Him. That doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean it's simple. doesn't mean it's clearly laid out. doesn't mean it's the answer that I want to hear. In fact, I think the story of the Magi give us some simple truths to help us as we're trying to find our way. We're going to talk about three of them. Here's the first one right here. Okay, Instead of being safe, following God is often dangerous. Instead of being safe, following God is often dangerous. In fact, we think that following God ought to be safe. It ought to be the safe way. That's how we know we're following Him, right? We, we think if we're living a safe, secure, comfortable, quiet life, then God's pleased with us and we must be on the right track. And so we've come to equate God's approval of our path with with you know, the, the safety that we're experiencing. But when things don't go as we hoped that they would, we wonder, well, what if God said right and we went left? Maybe we missed out. Maybe we didn't hear it right. What, what, what if we got off somehow? Did we somehow miss God's will? We think that if life goes well, we must be following God's will. And if, 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 if let's say, uh, things aren't going well, uh, then, uh, yeah, we must admit it. If things are going well, we're going to get rewarded. If things aren't going well, we won't get, get rewarded. If, if, if they're going well, then we must be doing what God wants us to do. But if you're not getting along with your boss, then uh, maybe you missed what God wanted you to know. Or we think that we're following God's will, we'll, we'll be on the receiving end of good, good luck, right? Uh, uh, they accepted the offer on the house, and the car doesn't break down. But when things don't turn out the way we planned, we wonder if somehow we missed God's plan for our life. 
And so the wise men remind us that following God can be dangerous. In fact, it's often dangerous for us. They find themselves in front of an evil king. Uh, they find themselves uh, in front of this man that's willing to execute little boys just to make sure he gets rid of Jesus. And after, after seeing Jesus, they suddenly realize that, that they're wanted men, that they're in trouble themselves. And so they, they find out that really following God is not always safe. Uh, let, letting God guide you, that, that doesn't necessarily mean this is the safe way. In fact, if you look at Scripture, everyone that follows God from time to time finds himself on a dangerous adventure. The Apostle Paul, he was on the rise making a name for himself before he became a Christian. But God spoke to him and he started following him. And it was only after that that he found himself beaten and whipped and stoned and without food and without clothing. Sometimes God leads us down a path that isn't safe or isn't comfortable. Here's the second thing that we learn about uh, these wise men, again, with God leading us and guiding us. Instead of being clear, following God is often mysterious. Instead of being clear, following God's often mysterious. You know, if you're really following God, we think it ought to be very simple and straightforward and apparent and, and clear for us. Step by step, right? That's how God leading us through it. We know that we're following Him because He leads us step by step. That's how we know God's in it. But the wise men, they're following the star, and apparently at some point it goes dark, right? They, they're not sure where they're, they're going, and so they're wondering, are we still going the right direction? Are we still going the right uh, place? Maybe we're following the wrong star. Maybe we got it wrong. And they question whether they're truly following God's guidance. And so we, can, we can be like that. We, we, we can be similar to that. We're not sure. We want assurance. We want confidence. And when it's not crystal clear for us, then we begin to wonder. And when we get to that point, sometimes we can make mistakes. Like, we look for a feeling or a sensation. We, we want something, again, to affirm for us that we're following God's will. And so sometimes we think that a feeling is, is how we know, how we know that we're following God's will. We just have this sense. And let's, let's be clear. Sometimes God leads us that way. Sometimes God leads us with a, a feeling or a sensation. But, but we do have to realize that feelings are often unreliable. Uh, they can change. You can't always trust them. The Bible says the heart is deceitful, right? So we have to be cautious of that. Or sometimes what we do in that case is we look for a formula. We, we want to follow God. We want to know His will. And so we look for this step-by-step -step process. And so we want to check off things so that we know that we're following God's will. Look, I, I, I checked off all the right things, but God can't be captured by a formula. It, it's not a simple process. It's not a formula that we, we follow. Here's the third thing that we do sometimes. We, we just freeze. Because we're uncertain, because we're not sure, we just don't move. We stop what we're doing. We, we want so desperately for God to speak to us clearly that when He doesn't, we're afraid that we might make... Uh, a mistake. Uh, we're afraid to make a decision. We're afraid that we'll mess things up. And again, the Magi in that situation, they just kept searching. They kept looking. They didn't just stop what they were doing. They kept the pursuit on. Or this is another area that we learn from the, the story of the Magi. Instead of being easy, following God is often demanding. Instead of being easy, Following God can be a demanding thing. God always, doesn't always guide you down the easiest path. In fact, following, following Him can be a demanding thing. It can be tiring. In fact, this trip for the Magi would have been a long trip for them. A thousand miles at least. Mountains, rocky terrain, desert, crossing over rivers. Probably three to four months, these magi were on their journey. It wasn't, wasn't easy. It was difficult for them. And so sometimes we, we make it sound like following God is the easy option. It's the easy choice. That following God is easy, but it's not. In fact, it's, it's usually the hard thing. And the hard thing is often the best thing.
You know, we like uh, the easy path. We prefer it easy. That's why we have things like diet pills, right? We don't want to go through the hard, disciplined approach. Just, can I take a pill and just lose the weight? If you take this, you know, it's a shortcut. It'll just make it happen. And so sometimes we think if we just follow Jesus, that that's the easy path. It'll be smooth sailing. Things will fall into place if it's God's will. But that's not always the case. In fact, following Jesus often results in a loss of job or a family conflict or ridicule at school or sleepless nights over a lost friend. It can be the more difficult thing. So if you talk to Christians, you might think that if we choose to follow God, life is just going to be easy street. But that's really not what the Bible says. In fact, listen to Mark 8, 34. It says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will save it. You know, Scripture describes the path to God as the road less traveled. It's not always the easy path. It's not always the easy way to follow. In fact, it's, it's easier to spend all your money on yourself. It's easier to skip church on Sunday. It's easier to give into temptation. It's easier to lash out in anger. It's easier, but it's not the best thing. When you see the star, remember that God doesn't always lead you down the easiest path. Sometimes God leads you down the path that is dangerous and mysterious and demanding. But I want you to notice in our story that the, that the, the wise men journey ultimately leads them to Jesus. I want to pick up the story again, Matthew chapter 2. Let's go all the way down to verse 9. Hope you'll feed, read through the rest of it. But we're going to jump to verse 9 where it says, The star that they had seen when it rose ahead went of them uh, it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was when they saw the star they were overjoyed on coming to the house they saw the child with his mother mary and they bowed down and worshiped him then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh so they finally find jesus and they're, they're filled with joy, and they worshiped Him. Do you want to really know what God's will is for your life? It would be that right there, for you to find Jesus and to worship Him. That's, that's what God wants for you. That's what God is hoping you will find. I don't know that God necessarily cares whether we, where we live or, or uh, whether it's here or there. I don't know that he necessarily cares whether we have this job or that job. What he really wants for you is for you to find Jesus and to worship him. In fact, God was so concerned with the wise men that he told them 600 years in advance and he gave them a star to guide them. And so here's what I'm wondering. Maybe God's doing that for you. Maybe God's doing that exact same thing for you. Maybe He's trying to lead if only you will follow. Maybe He's not leading you by the light of a star. Maybe that's the different thing, but what if God is trying to lead you by another means? What if He's trying to lead you by the light of, of suffering? You're going through a difficulty right now, and, and uh, that God often through those uh, unfortunate circumstances is, a, is leading us, taking us to Jesus. Or maybe He's leading you by the light of creation. The Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And maybe just by the things that you see around you, they're pointing you to Jesus. Or maybe God's leading you through the light of a person. There's a family member or a friend who's who's walking beside you and, again, trying to, to point you to Jesus. Or maybe He's trying to lead you by the light of His Word. Uh, King David said in Psalm 119, he wrote, Your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Maybe, maybe God's Word is pointing you 
to Jesus. And maybe your journey has led you to this point right where you are and God is leading you to Jesus and simply hoping that you'll recognize him as your Savior. Pray with me. Father, we pause and just say, say thank you for leading us, for guiding us. And, and forgive us, God, when we've, uh, we've looked for the easy path, the comfortable path, the less demanding path, uh, the clearly lit path, instead of recognizing that that's not always the case. And we're grateful for this story just to assure us again that it's not always safe and it's not always easy and it's not always comfortable. But we're thankful, Father, that the, at the end of the journey is Jesus. Would you point us, continue to point us, and may we always pursue him. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.